You know, the testimonies have been coming forth, and uh, Brother Sam sang that song, and he testified. Uh, if you know Brother Sam, you know that he's different. But I call him uh, my miracle man, and because I was there when he had his accident, and I was there in ICU um, when he couldn't speak, and I was there when his mind was scrambled, where he couldn't put sentences together. And I was there when God brought him back. He was able to speak. And I, I tell you, sometimes we just don't understand. And I'll be honest. If anybody, if I could have said anybody was going to pass away, it would have been Sam Jeffers. But God had some more work for him. Uh, our sister today, that T-Bone, God is, God is just gracious. You're here for a reason and a purpose. Mother Monday, cancers. Um, been there with her where the doctor said we can't do anything but she's still here and I could go on and on and on some of you have stories some of you have stories that you don't even know about you, you don't even know about that head on collision that was just for you this morning but God sent a ministering angel you, you don't even know about the drug overdose that you took you, you didn't know about that that the death angel wanted to take you away right then you, you, you don't even know about when you were born and, and the doctor came in and your blood pressure wasn't right and your mother's blood pressure wasn't right but God said no no you, you, you don't even know about the house fire that should have been at your house but God in his grace and mercy he grabbed that electrical unit and said no, you don't even know about the smoke that was in the fire that you were in that other folks died from but somehow some way God opened up the door and I could continue on and on and on but yet when we have time to praise him let's worship
together the steadfast love. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy. Jacob's leather, we are climbing soldiers of the cross. Male chorus.
higher and higher. At this time, we're going to have our scripture selection given to us by uh, Deacon Kelly, followed by our morning announcements by Mother Face around. conversation in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my father. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preached the faith which once, once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading and understanding of his holy word this morning. Amen. Amen. We're just going to recite about how God adds to his kingdom. 2 Kings chapter 3. I want you to look at you know, that 11th verse. 2 Kings chapter 3 in the 11th. If you're visiting with us for the first time, uh, we always try to give a scripture during our, our giving time. Uh, we call it gifts of love here because God is just blessed us. So whatever state that you're in, um, there's no pressure put on you to give. Um, God loves a cheerful giver, and we believe in that. And over these years, we've seen God work in a mighty, mighty way. We've been letting you know about the major renovation that's right around the corner of our parking a lot in the back. And uh, also, last Sunday, we told you to get in contact to Deacon Kelly and uh, Deacon Rudd, if you ever had any questions or any suggestions, and hopefully when the weather breaks, uh, we can be sure that it's not going to snow again. Uh, we can get those uh, renovations started. But thank you for your little giving. And I say this because I'm excited about what God. We're doing this debt-free. Uh, it's always of $100,000 because of your liberal giving that we're able to do this the right way according to God's grace. So we're giving him to something. We've been patient and thank you, thank you for that. Look at this scripture. I was uh, this morning just kind of meditating. Um, I was thinking about our giving and I say this, our giving not just on Sunday but every day of the, the week. And I want to focus on uh, something else, another part of our giving that I think we're lacking in. Um, 2 Kings chapter 3, it's actually talking about Moab and the rebels against Israel. And they're looking for a prophet, a prophet to speak in their lives. And from this section of scripture, we get a, a real good picture of what giving should be about. It says, but Jehoshaphat said, is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? Some one of the servants of the king of Israel answered, and said, Elijah the son of Shaphat is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. That verse again, I want you to think about, but Jehoshaphat said, is there no prophet of the Lord here, that we may inquire of the Lord by him? So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha the son of Shaphat is here, who poured water 
on the hands of Elijah. Now, if you're familiar with this story, Elijah did awesome. That's J-A-H, did awesome uh, miracles and, and wonders. Uh, but Elisha, that followed him, S-H-A, uh, he was actually able to do double men, uh, miracles. And, and the reason is, in the early part of Elisha's S-H-A uh, ministry, he washed the hands of Elijah, J-A-H. He literally poured water on his hands, and he did, he volunteered his services to do whatever he could do to help that prophet. And I think this is very important, even in churches. Uh, we're having a hard time uh, getting volunteers many times, not just at Ebenezer, but people want to get paid all the time. But I, I really want to let you know, um, and some of you know, when you volunteer your time, you don't get paid by us or anybody else, but you get paid by the Lord. And, and when God pays you, God gives you a paycheck that don't run out. That, that makes sense. See, some of y'all ain't real. You ain't get your paycheck. And you ever got a paycheck and it's gone? You know, you've got it in your hand. You got you like, woo, woo. But, but your flesh already is gone. When you, when you put it in, when you put it in the bank, somebody already asking for it. But when God pays you, he's able to do a supernatural thing. So I want to encourage you. We've, we've got a lot of wonderful volunteers here at Ebenezer. But if you're not involved in Ebenezer, if you're not involved in volunteering somewhere, that is a portion of your giving that's very, very important. Uh, we have Boy Scouts here, and oftentimes it's hard to get male leaders. We've got Girl Scouts, it's hard to get female leaders. Uh, we've got furniture to be moved. There's uh, Red Cross, uh, soup kitchens in Greensboro. It's hard to get volunteers. Uh, you just can't come to church and sit on a pew. But if you're a believer, you've got to reach out and you've got to assist, you've got to volunteer. And, and I've been saying this over and over. Uh, it's not my original quote, but you can't beat God's giving no matter how hard you try. Try giving yourself. When you give yourself, God can do exceedingly abundantly above what you can dare ask to think. Find somebody to pour water on their hands. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Uh, for this awesome scripture, just one scripture, but it showed the background of this wonderful prophet and how you blessed him in the future, Lord, to be a mighty man of God, to do double the miracles of his predecessor. Lord, thank you. Father, help us to have an attitude and a, a day that it seems like hirelings are at hand, Lord, and everybody wants to get paid for their talents and gifts and all of those things, Lord, and, and we thank you that, that many are paid. But, Lord, I thank you for the, the heart of volunteers, the, the heart of people, Lord, that don't want anything from anybody. They just want to glorify you, Lord, and be moved. So, Lord, I pray for more of those hearts to reach out, more of those hearts to sense the need, Lord, in Ebenezer and in our community, Lord, and just can say, Lord, use me in whatever way. Uh, you would use this in. Now, Lord, I thank you for Ebenezer and our officers, Lord, for the wisdom that you've given us with finances. We don't take that for granted. Lord, let all these funds that are taken up glorify you as we reach out uh, here locally and we reach out abroad. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the opportunities that you've bestowed upon us. Uh, we just give you praise, honor, and glory. Help us to be cheerful givers. In Jesus' name, amen. We ask the officers to come forward.
day. Thank you for all the sunshine and everything you bring. Thank you for life itself.
like a little more up here, be close to the full day with that David and Wednesday plan. They like to come more to the full day just going out of the water with that. We just thank God for his grace and mercy. Now he just continues to say us. Uh, nobody can do that but the Lord. And I want you to speak back to the times in your life. The times that you went through in spite of yourself. That God saved you. That God delivered you. I remember I told this story a lot. I was downtown up in Virginia, up in the mountains. A little cold creek. I'll never, ever forget that. God came into my life and just changed my life. I know that you tell me I'm the testimony of how God came in your life. I was a great little David. He was up here two Sundays ago and gave me the testimony. Jesus and this time I'm going to ask uh, Reverend Lucas uh, to give us a scripture, I think it's out of Romans chapter 8, uh, as he grabs this scripture, is going to give us a simple a picture of what baptism is all about, a powerful symbol of how God shows us that he takes us to that death, burial, and resurrection. Reverend Romans chapter 6. <laughs> Romans chapter 6, beginning with the first verse. And it reads thusly What shall we say then? Shall we continue on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us were baptized unto Christ Jesus, were baptized unto his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into his death, in order that just as Christ was risen from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For well, we have been united with him in death like this. We will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection, in a resurrection like this. For well, we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the bird, so that the body ruled by sin may be done away with. That we no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. All right, all right. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe also that we live with him. We believe that we will also live with him, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mystery or mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Yeah. Amen. Within that scripture, we we'll find out that there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. It's in Romans chapter 8 and 6 as you go to that entire book. And today, as we take David's hand, we're going to bring him to the water. That's the picture of Jesus going to the grave. And we're going to take him under the water. That's the picture of Jesus when they put him in that cold tomb. But the great thing today is we're not going to leave David under the water. All right. We're going to bring it back up. And that's the picture of Jesus getting up on the third day with all power and all glory. What a wonderful symbol today. I'm so excited to have you. I'm really glad to be here today. Uh, she prepared herself to take us to that old camp and take me to the water.
say this to each and every one of us. We never know when, how, or where God will call us. So be ye also ready. So when the Son of Man call your name or my name, then we can all leave this place and go into a place where there's more crime. Yeah. No more dying. But there shall be peace yeah. Yeah. and tranquility yeah. everywhere. Yeah. And Deacon Wilson come in, lead us to the throne of grace. Thank you. Constantly be in prayer with us yeah. and for us and for those who are on the sick and shut in. Yeah. 
My wife is a talker, y'all should know that by now. She loves to entertain folk. But for those who you want to go to the hospital, make your visitation as brief as possible. No more than 10 to 15 minutes. We are asking. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
and we do it very carefully. Lord, when we think about your goodness, your grace, and your mercy, we can't help but say hallelujah. Now, Lord, I'm incapable of teaching and preaching properly this word today. So I welcome your Holy Spirit yet again that we sense that's moving in our hearts. So, Lord, I ask you, Holy Spirit, would you teach us and guide us and lead us into all truth. Please make this word so plain, so easy to be understood, that even a small child can be transformed to be like you. Dear Lord, I ask you to be in my eyes and my seeing, my mouth and my speaking, my heart and my understanding. Thank you for your anointing, Lord, on this communion Sunday, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We're intensely thinking about you. Touch our hearts, Lord, that tender part of us where all permanent takes place. Permanent change takes place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Are you ready for God's word today? Let me ask you to please open those Bibles back to where we were on last Sunday. Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16. This thing good to me as I just to hear the voice of the Lord to finish this chapter up on this Sunday. Numbers chapter 16. Got some emails and some calls that some folks were looking for holes under their house. <laughs> Make sure that there were no holes under their house. My little nephew told his mom that she he wanted to tell me that there was a hole in his house. <laughs> some you got some holes in your house. Numbers chapter 16. Just an awesome portion of scripture. I want you to start looking at around that 47th verse. 47th verse. That CNN story that we brought forth about the man being swallowed up. They're still searching. Um, it's just amazing what God can do. God allows to be done. We need to be aware we can go at any time. That's why we got to live holy unto Him. Numbers chapter 16, starting at that 47th verse, it reads, Then Aaron took it as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly. And already the plague had begun among the people. So he put in the incense and made atonement for the people. And Aaron stood between the dead and the living, so the plague was stopped. At verse 48, I want you to really picture that. We want to get it in our minds today. And he or Aaron stood between the dead and the living, so the plague was stopped. Um, we want to speak from the subject today. Standing between the dead and the living. Standing between the dead and the living. Uh, the time frame around 1440 uh, B.C. or so as we are in those plains, um, the wilderness area. Uh, this is an amazing time as uh, we're looking at 1450, 405 to 450 B.C., they're about in that area approximately, that the children of Israel have come out of Egypt from the bondage of slavery, crossed over the Red Sea. On last Sunday, we went in detail that uh, it should have took them uh, about two weeks, uh, and traveling slow to get through that wilderness area. But because of unbelief, because of them not trusting the Lord. And as we talked in our Sunday school this morning, not having faith, uh, they will go around and round in circles for 38 years, 3 months, and 10 days. Uh, can you imagine that a two-week journey because of complaining, because of not trusting the Lord, takes 38 years, 3 months, in 10 days. Uh, some of you can identify because you should have been in your promised land by now, but because of your lack of faith, because of your belly aching and complaining and murmuring, you're still going around in circles, still complaining about the same old, same old, and not seeing how God has already blessed you. 
As we're in the wilderness today, remember on last Sunday, we specifically focused on Kor. Uh, Korah and his followers stood up against Moses and Aaron and in essence said uh, that as Levites we can be priests also. Uh, Moses being a, a man of humility, he prays unto the Lord and he said God is going to decide this and if God does something that's new that's never been done before then we know who the leader is. Cor and his family. It was a very heartbreaking story on last Sunday. His children, his wives, and all those that were with him stood at the household brazenly against uh, God's leader. And God opened up the ground and swallowed up Cor and his family and his house and all of those that were against God's will. And even fire came out of that temple and it burned up those who were going against what God had said. You would think that after a judgment like this, you would think after God allows something uh, to happen in our lives that shakes us up, that that really lets us know that there is a God that we would get it together. You, what, what do you think after that DUI and that accident that you were in where you were thrown out the car and, and, and you should have been dead that you, you would have got what God was trying to but you, you would think that after all the stuff that you've gone through when the doctors walked away from you and said they couldn't do you no good, but God came in your room in spite of your mean and ugly and hateful self, that, that you would get it by. You would think that after all those problems that we would trust God, that we would get it right, that we would say, God, I can't do it within myself, but I need your grace and your mercy. You would think after seeing all of these people swallowed up within the mouth of the earth, that the children of Israel would be on the Lord's side. But today we pick up the 41st verse. It's been about 24 hours. Uh, since the people were screaming and uh, they were in fear of God's awesome power 24 hours those folks went back to their tents and, and we see studying the time it was about 2.5 million folks Israelites that were out there in the wilderness they, they went back to their houses not to pray but to gossip they went back to their tents not to, to get their, their sails and focus to the Lord, but they got together and started talking amongst themselves, uh, missing out on the miracle that God had showed in this 41st verse on the next day. Can I just divert? I, I want to get through this quick today, but on the next, and you complain the next day after God has showed you something, it didn't even take 24 hours. And you complained again. On the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, saying, you have killed the people of the Lord standing between the dead and the living. Now, 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 now Moses and Aaron couldn't do this themselves. They, they had prayed unto the Lord and God showed who was in charge. But, but notice how folks are. If they can't get to God, they'll start blaming other folks. That's why some folks can't get along with people. You, you got to understand, it's really not about you. See, they're mad at God. They're mad at God because of what he's doing in their life and they don't understand it. So since they're not big and bad enough to take it out on God, they'll blame you. It was obvious that God did what the judgment upon Cor and his family, but, but they need to lash out at somebody. They need to complain against somebody. And the leaders that are there, Moses and Aaron, they literally charged them and said, it's your fault that these folks will keep I, I love this because oftentimes we can be short-sighted. Uh, we can see the stuff that's good in our lives, but we forget about all the bad stuff. But we, 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 they, they forgot that Cor and, and his, his followers were against God's will. They, they forgot that they went against the flow of the spirit of the Lord. They forgot all of that. And notice what they did. They said, you have killed the people of the Lord. Isn't that how we do at funerals sometimes? Everybody knows that that person is a low-down nobody. Everybody know just because they went to church that they weren't saved and they weren't sanctified but yet all of a sudden we want to say they were so loving and so kind. They loved you one time out of the year on Christmas 
Christmas because they wanted to get something back. Standing between the dead. Moses and Aaron, we're upset with you guys. We're upset. We, we want to go back to Egypt because you killed the people of the Lord. It wasn't supposed to go down like this. Notice verse 42. Now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron that they turned toward the tabernacle of meeting. And suddenly the cloud covered and the glory of the Lord appeared. Standing between the dead and the living. Uh, Moses and Aaron understood something that when you talk about me, be careful because if I'm in God's will, you're really not talking about me, but you're really talking to the Lord. We, we need to be careful who we mess with in our lives because if they are a child of the king and if they're in the will of the Lord, you're not fighting against flesh and blood. You, you need to understand that. But there's some there's a God that sits high and he looks low and he's fighting our battles. We, we got to understand and sometimes even in our lives as Christmas, Christians who are in the will of the Lord, we can get off kilter and think that, you know what, we got to fight our battles. You don't have to fight your battle. If the Lord is on your side, though the devil be against you, he's more than the whole world is against you. Please understand, if God is on your side, the devil can only do that which God allows. So God hears the complaints. Oftentimes in our prayers, when we pray to God, we, we know he hears us. We're lifting up our prayers unto him. But when we talk to other folks, we think that all of a sudden God closes his window and he can't hear. What stuff has he heard you say to somebody else? But God has to show up. Look at these swoops in. I love this in the Old Testament. God would leave them a cloud by day and a fire by night. But literally, the cloud was there in the day so they could see that very presence of God. And they could follow God wherever he went. And he made a fire at night because in the dark they couldn't see unless they had those headlights out in front of them. But now that these people have spoken through against Moses and Aaron within 24 hours the next day, God comes down within the cloud. And he covered the tabernacle as Moses and Aaron understand if, if God is going to do something, we need to look to the temple. We need to pray because these folks don't know the line that they cross. You got to be careful in your life. You got to be careful because there's some stuff that we complain about and belly ache. We really cross the line. I, I remember in high school, I know some of you are, are older than me, but, but at my time, if you were going to fight somebody and didn't really want to fight them, you would actually draw a line in the sand or the dirt and you would dare them. You cross this line and we're going to fight. But oftentimes, thank God in my experience, they never crossed the line and nor did I cross the line. But here they cross the line. Is upset. You don't want God upset. But look at verse 43. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of me. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, get away from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces. God comes in on a cloud, and, and, and I don't care what you say, theologically, when you look at the scripture, God gets upset. That now, now you can you can try to rationalize it all. He is a, a God of peace and a God of grace and a God of mercy. You read Revelation, though, in the Old Testament, he's a God of judgment, and judgment is coming. We're in a time of grace, but God was upset. Wouldn't, wouldn't you be the your, your creation that you brought out of Egypt, your creation that you're feeding manna from heaven to, your creation that you're giving water out of rock, but they continue to complain, they continue to talk about you, wouldn't you be upset? So Moses and Aaron are at the tabernacle, and God says, you know what I'm doing? I'm tired of these folks. I'm tired of these 2.5 million, actually it's less than 2.5 million because Cor and his family and his followers are gone. He said, you know what? There are some other folks that are not in the group, but they still, they got the same mindset. So, so I don't have to deal with them. I'm just going to wipe them right out right now. Just going to get rid of them. What if God came today and said, you know what? I'm tired of this. I'm going to wipe those folks in Ebenezer Baptist Church that were in the club last night. I'm tired of this. I'm going to take out all the fornicators. I'm tired
today. Get away! But Moses and Aaron understand intercession. If it had not been for grace, some of us are still here today because Grandma fell on her face when she knew the death angel was going to get you last night on Thursday night. And, and Mama fell on her face and said, Lord, please don't let, please don't let my child die in that situation. Would you give him or her just a little bit more time? Please, Lord. Moses and Aaron began to pray. Look at verse 46. Moses said to Aaron, we got to move. We got to move quick. God's anger is burning. Take a censer and, and put fire in it from the altar. Put incense on it and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For the wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. Stand between the dead and the living. Now there's something that's going on. When God showed up with the cloud, Moses and Aaron fell down from the uh, on their faces and began to intercede. All of a sudden, as they went down, Moses and Aaron are looking up out of the corner of their eye, and folks are falling. Left and right, the plague came. I, I, it doesn't explain what type of plague, but whatever. A disease hits the folk, and literally when it hits them, folks are dying just like that. They're taking their last breath. Can you hear them falling? Family members are falling up against daddy and mama. They're looking around, all around them, and it's 2.5 million droves of folks, 3.1 miles or so in that area. They're falling left and right, and Moses says, oh, Oh my goodness, we got to do something because if we don't make atonement or reparations for what is going on, God is going to kill everybody. So he says, Aaron, get up. Now this is amazing because I know Aaron was like, won't you get up? But, but Aaron was in that priesthood and Moses understood. It was kind of like those, those cop stories. You know, they say, you run out and I'll cover you. You, you, you go forth and I'll cover you. What, what stuff in your life too, Aaron, and, and if I'm not covering you in prayer, you may not make it to the fire to bring atonement to the folk. So Aaron says, okay, I got this. Aaron runs to the temple. And in the temple, there's a fire that, that always would burn because God actually lit the fire. It would burn 24 hours, seven days a week, and it would represent the fire of God. We see the fire of God in Acts chapter 2 coming down as holy, or the Holy Spirit setting upon them. The same is in the temple. So Aaron, he runs in and he takes a censer so he can put that fire in the censer and he makes atonement for the folk. He runs out into the midst of the people with God's presence in his hand. The cloud is still up. The cloud at this point is judgment because folks are dying. But there's another part of God's presence in the censer is grace. And mercy. God said, I'm going to judge these folks. Get out of the way. But Moses understood something about the character of God. When you understand something about the character, it'll make you shout. It'll, it'll bring tears in your eyes. Though, though he say me, Joe, Joe said this. Yeah, will I trust you? There's a character trait of God. That, that he's a merciful and kind God. That, that stuff can be going in your life and you can be feeling like you're about to lose it. But there's something the mercy of God. I dare you just to cry out to him and say, Lord, I need you right now. I, I don't like where I am right now, but God, would you show me some mercy? So Aaron, he runs out and he, he runs into the midst of the crowd. This, this 2.5 million that's dwindling real quick. They're dying left and right. Left and right. Following. Aaron has that censer of the Lord with fire in it and he comes out into the middle of the crowd there about in verse 47. Then Aaron as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly. And already the plague had begun among those people so he put in the incense and made atonement for the people. He made penance for the people. As, as Moses is saying, God forgive us, forgive us, forgive us, forgive us because the folks don't even know what's really happening. They're looking around. They're in a daze at, at this plague that's hitting them. They really can't pray for themselves. 
stuff. Aren't you glad that somebody is praying for you as we said before? Aren't you glad when you can't see death around the corner, there's somebody calling out your name? Aren't you glad for intercessors? Standing between the dead. People are following. Uh, Aaron gets in the midst of them with that atonement. God, please forgive us. Please forgive us. And look at this. This is a powerful scripture, verse 48. And he stood between the dead and the living. So the plague was stopped. Folks are falling, and it seems to indicate is Aaron goes out in the midst a lion is drawn. And it's a beautiful picture of grace. People on one side are dead. But yet somebody else on the other side that should have been dead. Because of Aaron in the middle. No, no, this is mind-boggling to me because honestly it was easier for me to come out with a title standing between the living and the dead. But notice in the scriptures are very specific. It says the dead and the living. And when we look back to Genesis, you must realize that as we were born into iniquity because of Adam and Eve's sin, we were dead men walking. We were dead on the inside. We like to think of ourselves as living, but without Jesus Christ, there is no living on the inside. So the scriptures are very correct here. The dead and the living. There's a, there's a symbol here as we look here that we see Aaron standing in the midst and they're dead folks on one side, but they're living folks on one side. And the only reason the living are still standing is because of the grace and mercy of God. Why are you still here today? I, I, I just want to stop. We, we, we're going to sum this up real quick. But why has God left you? Now, now I know some of you, you're not going to get this because you, you think you never really did anything that bad. bad. You, you, you think because your, your mama was in the church and your daddy was a deacon and, and, and you may, may have somebody who was a bishop in your family. I, I don't know. You, you may have known the Pope or somebody. And, and you come from a, a good, good, upstanding family that somehow you felt that God shouldn't kill you, couldn't take you out. But please understand that there's sin in all of us. The scriptures are very clear in this. All of us have sinned and come short of the kingdom of heaven. We've fallen short of the kingdom of heaven. So in essence here, God had every right to wipe out everybody because all of them had sinned. But if it had not been for the grace and the mercy of God moving on Aaron as he stands in the midst of the dead. Feel the tenseness as the plague is going so fast and so quick. And in, in essence, as he stands there with the grace of God, God stop. How close have you been to death? Where God's grace just said, the, 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 the deaf angel was just hovering over you, and God's grace said, Stop, hold up. Hold up. I, I remember the young man, I was I was coming out in front of an ice cream truck and, and literally, I'm, I'm telling you, I should have been dead today. I should have been dead today. I had just learned how to curse. I, I really did. I, I got on the bus and my, my family raised me not to curse, but all the other little kids were cursing on the bus and I had tried to do that thing and I was at the ice cream place at that time. I came out in front and when I came out in front, there was a car that was, it seemed like it was about five feet from me. It was moving at 35 miles per hour on on Pine Street here in Greensboro and all I heard was the brakes lock up and the car just sleep. It was in slow motion. I was on my bike. I couldn't move and I froze right there and the car came within inches. Maybe that was God saying, you know what? I could have took you out. But there was somebody that was interceding and standing in the middle that the angel ran in between and said, hold up. I know he ain't all that. I, I in his life, but God has something bigger that's going on. And just give him a little bit more time. I know he deserves death, but grace. The plague subsides. Aaron, I know he's shaking right there because he understands that God could have took him out. What he's holding on at this point, he's holding on to grace. Oh God, you 
can kill me too. But God, I'm holding on to your grace and your mercy. Now look at verse 49. Now those who died in the plague, look at that number. 14,700 people. Besides those who died in the core incident. We're talking seconds here for them to do all of this. And within seconds, because of God's judgment coming upon them, 14,500. The Greensboro Coliseum, some of you have been looking at the Greensboro Coliseum, it actually holds around 23,000 people at its maximum capacity using all of its seats. 23,000 seats. That, that means that literally about half the folks, if God sent a plague like this, would die. 50% of those folks would be gone. We see 14,700 die within a amount of seconds. And God could have took out more. Final verse, verse 50. So Aaron returned to Moses at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. For the plague had stopped. Can you see Aaron as he looks and Nobody else is falling. He has that sensor and he, he walks back slowly to the tabernacle. Puts the fire back to the fire. I know you began to praise the Lord for his goodness. Well, even in this, after all this judgment, you know what the children of Israel did? Didn't take long. But they went right back to sin. Sad to say that some of you, after looking for holes under your house, after wondering if God is going to send a plague to you, after looking over your shoulder for about 24 hours or so, you'll go back to doing the same old, same old. But aren't you glad for a God that didn't kill everybody? But he did show grace and mercy. And as we go into the New Testament, that's why he sent his son Jesus. Because he knew that we couldn't do it within ourselves. He knew how, even how hard we would try to, to be holy and sanctified, that there had to be a way of deliverance and atonement that we couldn't produce in ourselves. So he sends Jesus' son and grows up amongst men. And at the age of 30, he goes into full-blown uh, ministry, letting us know how we can be delivered and set free. And letting us know that he was truly the Hosanna of the Hosannas, the Savior of the world, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. And without him, we would be nothing. But understand this picture of the symbol of the Old Testament. There must be an atonement for our sins. In essence, for an atonement to take place, somebody has to die. God grace has become and use somebody's life and I'm so glad that God didn't try me out in that because it wouldn't have been enough for you please understand the Catholic Pope can't be your atonement please understand mom and daddy can't be your atonement but I'm talking about Jesus the Christ who prayed in the garden of Gethsemane he prayed until sweat as drops of blood permeated out of his pores aren't you glad that he was the one that stood between the dead and the living for us Aren't you glad that he was beaten all night long for you and me? He carried our griefs and bore our pains on his back. I tell you, that's good news today. But what I'm so glad about it, they put a crossbar on his back. Actually, he allowed them to do that because he said, I could have called legions of angels to set them free. Aren't you glad that God is a good God? He's a God of grace and mercy that legions of angels could have come down and Jesus could have been set free and went his way. But